afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first Tools in Action session of this afternoon. We are going to talk over the, the next half hour about uh, box views and immutable infrastructure, a bit of the future of continuous delivery and where things are heading in that space. So we, um, um, we've got quite an agenda today. Um, just um, I'm not going to lose too much time about talking about myself. My, my name is Axel Fontaine. Some of, um, some of you may know me through my open source project Flyway, which is uh, for database migrations. Uh, if you're um, using a relational database today and haven't uh, introduced a tool into your project to uh, deal with the structural migrations and making sure that they happen in an orderly manner, I highly recommend you to um, to uh, have a look at that. The uh, Flyway homepage has a uh, comparison matrix for the different tools available in the JVM space. So my advice there is just pick any tool, the simplest one that'll do the job for you, and you'll be much better off. But the main subject of today will be, uh, will be uh, box views and immutable infrastructure. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. We have, uh, we have only 30 minutes, so it's rather a small slot. So I would like to ask you to hold on to any questions until the, uh, the end of the session. If we do have time, I'll do my best to answer them. Otherwise, the break is rather short. So unfortunately, I'll have to make room for the next speaker, but I'll be available in the hallway to, um, to answer them there afterwards. Okay, so let's get to know each other. Um, I'm going to ask you all to, uh, to raise your hands and, um, and keep your hands up as long as the statements that appear here are true to you. So which level of automation are you at? Does everyone have an automated build? All the hands up? Yes? Okay. Who's doing unit tests? Everyone, pretty much? Yes? Who's, uh, who's got a CI environment up and running? Everyone? Acceptance tests? Okay, quite a few hands going down already. We've got about 70% of the hands still up. Who's doing continuous deployment of code? Oh, a lot of hands going down. We're at 30% left. Who's doing continuous deployment of the code, database changes, configuration? Okay, we've got about 10 hands left. And who's doing automated infrastructure deployment? Anyone left? No? Okay. So, let's dive right in. Typical workflow, huh? we, we've got our version control on the one end, and we've got our CI environment. And uh, what happens here is, of course, well, we, as uh, we check in uh, something into version control, our CI environment is a bit like the neutral referee that we'll check to make sure that what we've checked in is actually working. So we check out the latest version of our sources, we build them, we test them, and we produce some kind of artifact. In the Java world, this is typically a jar file, a war file, an ear file, whatever. But it turns out that this artifact has a number of interesting properties. We, um, we actually produce one immutable unit, so we do not change it later after it's been produced. Our jar file is, uh, is, uh, is just one unit, and if it needs to change, we just re regenerate a new one. We check in a change, and then the production pipeline just goes, and it produces a new one, so that we then end up with something that we are able to promote from environment to environment, so that we first deploy it in development, if it's working there, we deploy it in test, and eventually we deploy it in production. And we avoid the classic mistake of rebuilding it for every single environment. Why? Because we want to make sure, of course, that what we run in production is actually what we tested in test. So that's why we avoid the build per environment and we promote one immutable unit from one environment to the next. Now. If we look at our server, where our software is running, we uh, actually have a number of, uh, of layers there. So it all starts with the hardware, and then on top of that, we've got an OS kernel driving the hardware, and we've got some uh, libraries, like the C library running on there, a language runtime, in our case, the JVM, and then an app server and our application. Whether the app server is embedded in the app or not doesn't really matter, but that's pretty much what we uh, have here. And the story we looked at so far with our CI environment really only addresses the top two layers. And we should ask ourselves the question, why aren't we applying these principles if they're so valuable? Why aren't we applying these principles to the rest of our server, to the other layers where we're running on? Why aren't we holding it to the same standards as our application? To understand that, we have to travel back in time. So we're going to start a big time machine, and we're going to go all the way back to the 20th century. 
was pretty wild times. Huh? Some of you may remember huh? this, uh, this yellow guy was running around there. This is how we used to play music, and apparently this was the device to rewind it. So it was, uh, it was quite exciting indeed, and, and we had this guy. And this guy loved it when a plan came together, and when his plan was to get a server, this is how he did it. He got on the phone, the old type of phone, and still with a cord and all that, and, and he called his good friend Michael, and he said, hey Michael, I would like a server. So Michael says, sure, and then a couple of weeks later, the server would get delivered, and eventually he'd put it into the rack and connect the power and the network, and then what? Well, we're not done. So we get on the phone again, and call a young criminal from the western coast of the United States that um, then delivers some criminal software that gets installed onto the machine and from there we basically start patching, updating and installing more stuff on it. So, how does this look? How does this fit into our workflow? We have our CI environment, we have our target environment where we want to deploy, so we kind of push our artifact to an artifact repository, which is really the binary equivalent of source control, and where instead of having the input product of the build, we store the output product of the build, and we then deploy that onto our server to update the app. Actually, not too bad, except reality doesn't really look like this. It looks more like this. We have many machines on many different environments. And of course, at some point, they need to be updated. And these updates need to happen at all layers on all machines. So this is typically the job of the system administrator, to make sure that the machines are as identical as possible to avoid any surprises later in the process. A little bit of wisdom from um, about 100 years ago, from this man who used to be in the automobile industry, Mr. Henry Ford, and he came up with this famous uh, quote, if, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said, a faster horse. And this is exactly what we got in IT. Instead of a sysadmin, we now have an automated sysadmin better known as a chef or puppet, that basically um, increases the speed at which uh, the system administrator would perform the tasks by doing these things in an automated way and making sure they'll work there. But it's not really fundamentally changing anything. It's just kind of adding a bit of efficiency to the process. But if we come back from the 20th century and fast forward to today, we live in a very different world. This is a quote from AWS reInvent from last year, so exactly one year ago. And the quote is so powerful, when you let it sink in, it's really incredible the magnitude we're talking about here. Every day, AWS adds enough server capacity to power the whole 5 billion enterprise Amazon.com was in 2003, weekends included. Every single day, the amount of capacity that comes online there is just insane. We have come from a world of scarcity to a world of abundance. It is a very different place. And so, with this new world we have, I believe it is time to rethink the faster horse. So, if we start by switching out physical hardware for virtual hardware, we now open up new possibilities. First of all, we can start producing images of entire machines as part of our build process. They can then flow through our artifact repository and get deployed onto our target environment so that we move from a picture like this to one like this, where we have machine images everywhere. If we write them correctly, they're even able to run on multiple types of virtual hardware, and we then eliminate the update problem at the individual instance level, and instead we promote them from environment to environment just like we've done with our artifacts before. But, one big problem. Our machine images do not fit through our network pipes. They are usually enormous beasts and it takes forever to transfer them, it's expensive to archive lots of versions of them, so we do have a bit of a problem here we need to deal with before this even becomes practical. 
So, we turn to a bit of wisdom again. A quote from um, a wise man, running servers in production should be like going backpacking. You take the bare minimum with you, anything else is going to hurt. This, by the way, is a fantastic picture I, I took last, uh, last summer in, um, in the Alps of uh, these guys, just four of them, that they'd walked a thousand meters up the mountain with a 20-liter barrel of beer, just the four of them, and the big glasses and the hammer to open, and, the, and just basically drank it all in one night and, and came back down, so, so I liked them immediately. But that's, uh, so that's the abs absolute opposite thing of what you want to do in production. In production, you want to be as lean as possible. And so to, um, to decide if we're going to trim some fat, to decide what to trim, we have to have certain criteria. And for me, the central criteria there is really to understand what is actually adding business value in our server and what is just technical ceremony. So let's have a look. We're going to x-ray inside our machine image and see what is adding value. Our application, of course, we need that to solve our customer's problem, so we're going to keep that. But do we need compatibility with old binary formats, 32-bit CPU architectures and other things? No. So let's get rid of that. We need our app server to actually run our app, so we're going to keep that, but no man page has ever helped a customer, so let's get rid of them. Has app get or RPM ever been of interest to my customer? Never. So off it goes. We get rid of the technical ceremony. We need to keep our language runtime, our JVM, to run our app. But do we need a C compiler on board? I don't think so. So off it goes. Do I want, in 2014, to open multiple consoles and tl-f to look into different log files? I don't think so. Those days are over. The logs should be centralized, should be made searchable, should be aggregated. So I do not want log files on the instance. If I don't have log files on the instance, do I even need VI and various editors? Probably not, so let's get rid of them. And the same applies to a whole bunch of other utilities that are typically lying around there. So if I don't have these things anymore, do I even need to be able to log in into an instance. I say, no. Let's get rid of SSH. And if I can't log into my instance, do I need multiple users? No, so let's get rid of them. If the very things I set out to protect with my firewall aren't there anymore, do I still need it? No, so let's get rid of it. Do I need a shell? No. Do I need drivers for all kinds of exotic hardware when all I need to support are just a couple of pieces of virtual hardware? No. So I'm going to keep some libraries because the JVM needs them to run in our case, but all a um, bunch of demons lying around we can get rid of, and we, of course, keep the kernel to drive our virtual hardware. Now, what we're left here is the bare minimum of what is actually adding business value. All the rest has been just technical craft. This is really what is solving our customer's problem. And we are going to fuse this together in what we call a bootable app. And we have now arrived in a very different world. This is about 40 megs plus the size of your app. So it's very small, meaning that it's very cheap to archive lots of versions of it, very fast to transfer. It's a very different value proposition. From a security perspective, we're talking about a very different beast as well, of course, because your potential attack surface has been reduced to the absolute minimum. So we are in a territory, in a, in a world that doesn't know shell shock anymore. We do not have these problems at this scale. So. Some of you may be thinking right now about all kinds of situations where this wouldn't work. It doesn't matter. Just use it for everything else where you have a simple app solving a business problem that is mostly stateless, accessing a database or something else. There are many more of these applications than there are of the Twitters of this world. So just use it for everything where you have a standard app. Now, let's have a look at this. I have a small demo here, just to show you it's live. I'm going to change some, um, some file here, so we'll, let's call it Hello DevOps, for example. 
show you that nothing is scanned. OK. So save that, and I'm going to switch to the console. For the demo, I'm going to use, um, going to use Box Use to show you how that works. So we're going to transform our, uh, our app. So we've got a simple WAR file here. If you have a look at that, huh, it's just a standard structure. So I'm quickly going to build it. I'm going to rebuild the WAR file. And then we are going to turn it into a bootable app, launch an instance on VirtualBox to start. So let's have a look at that. Clear the screen, and what we do is box use run, and we point it at our payload, in this case, the WAR file. So what is happening now is that um, we are turning the WAR file into, um, into a bootable app. So you have to know that this laptop is about four years old. So on modern hardware, this takes about five seconds. Here, we're done in about 10. What uh, we fused together there is, of course, our app. We've added uh, an app server. We've added uh, the JVM, the, the C library, the OS kernel, a bootloader. And we've got an instance that we've created there. We've started it on VirtualBox. And we have received an IP address where um, we already got an HTTP 200. So we're just going to copy paste this in the browser to have a look. And let's, here's the browser. Going to copy paste it. Here we go. And there we go, that's our app up and running, Hello Devox. That didn't exist basically a couple of seconds ago on brand new virtual hardware. Now, we can um, have a look at some things. So if we, um, if we have a look at, um, we can, uh, just to show you that it's actually booting, just going to have the view at the logs here. So I'm pull up the instance ID. And that's basically the logs of the, the machine starting. So if we go, Go back up, we, we see here we kind of boot and we obtain an IP address and then basically a bit of a summary that we're on board and that our app is there. And then this is basically the standard uh, Tomcat startup um, script from, uh, that we all know. So if we, um, if we look at the, um, at the instances, uh, we, can, we can see with Box Use PS, we can see the, uh, the running uh, instances. So that's our new instance that we started there that we that we launched, and uh, it's based on this bootable app. So we can list the bootable apps with BoxFuse LS. And what we're going to do now is uh, basically launch another instance of this. But this is where, uh, where the demo gets a little bit risky. We're going to do it in the cloud, and I'm going to ask you to vote whether we are going to launch it in Brazil or in Japan. Who would like to launch this in Brazil? Couple of hands, yeah, we've got, got a fair number. Who would like Japan? Oh, it's a close call. Okay, let's, um, let's do Brazil. So, um, so uh, we're basically going to uh, box use run. We're not going to regenerate anything. We're just going to reuse this guy here. And I'm going to switch the platform instead of uh, VirtualBox, which is the default. I'm going to switch it to AWS. And we are going to switch the region to South America, East 1. And off we go. So basically what is happening here is that um, the, um, the image itself will then uh, get transformed to, uh, to the format that we need for AWS. And we're uploading it there to um, basically register it as an AMI and making it running there. So that's uh, luckily. DevOx invested in good networks, so, uh, so we're already up. They're, the, um, they're scrambling at the Amazon data center right now to, to kind of plug in the cables and, and make sure that that works. But, uh, but basically, we've converted our image. We've uploaded it to, uh, to Amazon. We've registered it there with them. And we, um, we uh, have been assigned an instance ID now, and we're just waiting for the instance to boot and the application to return an HTTP 200 in the data center in Sao Paulo. So there we are, up and running. So let's copy paste this guy and have a look in the browser. Copy, new tab, paste. Here we go, up and running on a brand new machine that is identical to the last bit and byte to the one I had on my local laptop. And it's running in the cloud in uh, the data center of Sao Paulo from Amazon. So. 
let's continue. What we've seen here, of course, is a, is a simple hello world thing, and the real world is a number of, uh, of other challenges which, which haven't been addressed by this, uh, this quick demonstration. So I think the, the first one that probably comes to mind is how do you deal with, with configuration? Because at the end of the day, we have different environments. We want to make sure that we do not connect to our development database when we're in production and vice versa. So we need to express these differences in some way, and that is what configuration is for. Now, it's actually quite easy. You can pass in key value pairs that can say the JDBC URL or the password is this and that, or your environment is such and such, and they then get fused at runtime when the instance starts with their bootable app to be exposed as environment variables, which your code then can then simply access and act upon as it wishes. And how do you do that? Quite easy. You just pass a parameter that says dash env dot environment variable name equals value. So actually pretty straightforward, and you just pass different values for different environments. Now, we briefly touched upon the logs earlier. So let's have a look at how they work in a world like this, in the world of 2014. Well. To better understand that, we need to, uh, to have a look at uh, how our application fits into the bigger scheme of things. So I've got our application here. We've got the load balancer, so we've got a request coming in, and that's being forwarded to the application that's then usually accessing a database, so just a classic architecture. Our logs will then um, need to uh, will not be able to exist on that instance. So how do we deal with them? The real world, of course, if we want to make sure we are safe, is we will be dealing with multiple availability zones so that our instance is, uh, our application is deployed redundantly and we can make sure that works fine. And our logs go to a centralized log server. There are fantastic um, services available online today, like logentries.com or Logly, that basically allow you to simply copy-paste an XML snippet into your logback or log4j configuration, and it automatically starts sending the logs to them so that they are then aggregated centrally, they are indexed, they are made searchable, they are archived, so they lots and lots of advantages over the crude tools we would have on instances. And if you do not want the centralized uh, solution like that hosted by somebody else, you can host your own with Logstash and other various open source projects available there to help you do that. So the next big, big question, of course, is how do we deal with session data? And it turns out that on the JVM, in the JVM world, we've We've lived in a bit of an exception. We, we've done things differently in the past than most of the other uh, platforms have done it. We've um, tried to replicate the sessions uh, between different nodes and creating clusters and all that, but there's, there's actually a much, much easier solution, and that is to simply use cookies. The cookie can, of course, be encrypted and signed to make sure it is not tampered with and it is not readable. And this, uh, this cookie then transparently supports your session data. So there are filters available for the JVM. There's, if you Google on, on GitHub, there's the Java stateless session filter that basically allows you to use the session API like you've always done. And instead, when the request goes out, it serializes it into a cookie and deserializes it when it, come when it comes back. The advantage is that you can now really start farming your servers. They do not have this state there, so you are able to kill them at any time without worrying that you're going to lose session data. You do not have to worry about um, having to deal with the whole sticky session, session affinity problems and slow updates. All that kind of disappears as well if you use cookies instead of that. If you're not comfortable with cookies, the, better, uh, the, say, uh, the, um, the alternative is to extract the session and put it towards the back instead of the front, so you can use an in-memory cache or a database. Anything is better than keeping it on instance. The advantage is, of course, also from a memory perspective, you get to provision the memory for the sessions that are actually computing right now not just the sessions that are open. So you get to drastically reduce the memory consumption there. Okay. 
But at some point, when everything's been deployed, you actually want to roll out some updates. So if the instance equals the application, how do you then make sure that gets updated properly? Well, there's a bunch of well-known techniques for that, and this is, um, again, fits into our world of, uh, of abundance instead of our world of scarcity. And so next to the existing app, you start the new version of the app. Once it's been tested and been declared healthy, the load balancer takes it on board, so it starts serving requests to those, and you can then start de uh, cutting the, the link to the old version of the app and decommission the old instances. And this way, you can achieve zero downtime upgrades of your app while exchanging it like that without any end-user impact. So, if we're going to recap this, we have seen that our application is produced as one unit that's immutable and regenerated after every change so that we can then go and promote it from one environment to the next. We avoid the classic mistake of building a separate artifact per environment to make sure that what we've tested in test is actually what will run in production later. And we apply the same principles to the remaining layers of our, um, of our server, and we fuse it together into a bootable app that is cheap to, uh, to archive, fast to transfer, and very secure. I highly, highly recommend you to, uh, to look into these principles, um, no matter what you're using. If you want a solution that's already ready-made that can help you for that, we, uh, we have box views there that can help you or you implement your own, but I hardly recommend you to have a look at those principles and implement them. Thank you very much. That's all I had for today. We have a few minutes for questions. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead. Yes? The question is, how do you compare um, box views to OpenShift? Um, I'm afraid I do not have enough in-depth uh, knowledge about OpenShift to be able to f uh, fully qualify to answer that question right now. Sorry. Yes. So the question is, how do you configure the different layers of the application? Um, what if I, um, um, how can I configure my logs or how do I deal with that? So the, um, um, there's multiple answers to that. So the, the first one is, of course, the different uh, layers, whether it's your Tomcat, your JVM and all that, you can uh, pin certain versions or by default it'll use the latest ones. Now for, um, uh, for the logs, it is actually, uh, um, you are able to uh, to lock things on the local uh, on the local host. The uh, the only thing you have to um, to be careful of, of course, is that as the instance gets uh, thrown away when you uh, install a new version, these things will be lost. So you can do some temporary storage there, but it's uh, it's really only that temporary. For persistent things, you should put it on some other service outside. What base image is used? There. Yes, what operating system base image is used? There is no base image, it is basically just a bootloader, a Linux kernel, with pretty much just one process. In reality, it's a bit more than one process because there is NTP and a, and a bunch of housekeeping things, but, um, but that's pretty much it. So it's really just a, Linux, a standard Linux kernel, standard OpenJDK, yeah, just standard stuff. But no, uh, no existing distribution. Yes? Can I configure the JDK version for a specific one? Yes, there, are, uh, there is a repository of, uh, of uh, all uh, versions available online, so you can pin the version to the exact one you want. This is a highly recommended, so that you, of course, do not get new versions pulled in by regenerating it, but you can control 
um, these things and upgrade at the time you feel ready to upgrade. So that's, that's an important thing there, and yes, you can pin it. Yes? So what's the way you configure the, the bootable app creation? You have, uh, you have two options. The first one we saw is passing it through the command line, but that's really just for, uh, um, for quick demos like this. Normally, you would uh, have a configuration file that contains key value pairs, just very declarative about uh, what, you, uh, what you want to include or which versions you want to pin or other functionality you want, you want to have activated. So, um, so I'm afraid we're out of time. So uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be available in the hallway. Otherwise, I thank you very much. And uh, have fun for the rest of the day.